Hey guys, what is going on? It is me, Cloud the Wolf, and welcome to RPG Maker MV. Today we're going to go over the basics of starting a project. I've already started this. It's a little project I'm working on. It's not going to be my major game that I'm making, the same with some of the other ones. So don't expect something too awesome, however I hope this to be very awesome if I do say so myself. But anyway, let's jump straight into it and how we go about starting our RPG Maker project. Now, you can start a project just by creating a new project and building from there, or if you want something more solid to work with and have a kind of default system where you can have pre-made attacks, pre-made weapons, pre-made armors, items, things like that, then that is also easy to do. If we take a look here, you can see that I already have over a hundred weapons created here. I also have a load of armors and some items, not a load of them, just some, as well as a load of attacks as well. Now you may be thinking, Cloud, how did you make all these attacks? Well, I'm going to let you into a secret. I didn't. So let's start by finding out how I got all these attacks, weapons, and armors. Because, as you know, when you start a new RPG Maker project, you don't actually get all of those in MV. So, what I did was I used the VX Ace 2 MV Converter, and I got these items. So, if we come over to RPG Maker VX Ace, I have added a new script. If we bring up scripts by pressing F11, or clicking the script icon up here, and come down to the materials section above main. I've got a convert me and we've got the conversion script here. And this little script comes free with the bonus pre-order DLC. However, you can also download it as well and I will put a link to that in the description below. So, if we come here and take a look and take a look at our weapons, oh hey, things are starting to look the same. Same with our armors, and also our skills. Obviously the icons are a bit different, but yeah, ignore that. So, how did we do this? Well, like I said, we used the converter. We then come into the game folder by going to game open folder. And it creates us this MV data folder. To get this folder, once you've installed the script, Click play. And close it. That's it. You have now created your MV data folder. So just go to game, open folder, and you've now got the MV data. Now, what we're not going to do is we're not going to copy all this over. The only things that I copied over was armors, enemies, not enemies, sorry. Items, skills, weapons, and that should be it. So we've got our armors, our items, our skills, and our weapons. So, where do we copy these two? Well, if we come over to RPG Maker MV, once again go to Game and Open Folder, we want to go into Data. And once again, we've got armors. Items, skills, and weapons. And I've created backups of the original before copying in these new ones just to make sure that it worked. Obviously, if it didn't work, I could then roll back without losing my data. It's a good idea to do this at the start of your project rather than halfway through, kind of like I did. Mistake on my behalf, I'm sorry. So, once you've done that, we can now set up everything we've got here. So, one thing you will need to do is you will need to go through and change the icons and amend some of the effects on certain weapons, skills, armors, things like that, as the states, positions have changed. So you may find that when you go to use guard, your guard skill is actually telling it to call another effect in like I found and got really confused. Mine was set to confusion, so that really confused me. Kind of a coincidence. 
So, once we've done that, we can playtest it. And make sure you save your changes. However, before doing this, let's see what scripts we've got installed. Scripts are now plugins, should I say. They used to be scripts, they are now plugins. I am using a lot of the YEP plugins, which is the Yamfly Engine plugins, which you can find a link in the description for below. These plugins have a whole range of effects. For example, if we look at the core plugin, we can change the screen resolution. We can also scale the battle bats to match this new resolution, as well as the title and game over. We can also reposition battlers to be in a more reliable place to find them. And that is what you need to do. If you want more information on these plug this core plugin, head over to the link in the description below where you can find out more, and I will also be going over how to effectively use plugins in a later date. So, now that we've got that, we can start our game. I've started my game with a simple custom map that I made, just by making it, I guess, where we have our main character here, and this character here. This event here is set to auto-run, and has a lot going for it. So. Let's go through this and see how we started our game. To start with, we're going to show picture 2 underscore 1 with the direct designation being at x100, y270 with a width and height of 100%. We're giving this image ID 1, picture number 1. We are then telling it to say something to the player. In this case, are you ready? And then we're using the C script to call in colour number 3, which in my case is green, as indicated by the window image. However, if you change your default window image, this may change. I'm then calling N1 for actor 1, and then returning the colour back to 0 for standard white. As you can see, if you hover over the text window, you can see a list of the default scripts you can call from within it. Finally, I'm using a different part of the script here. As you can see, I'm doing slash n open the triangular brackets, the more than and less than symbols, and then doing slash n square bracket three close brackets. Now, you may be asking why I'm doing this. Well, when I preview it, it looks like this. However, Let's play test it and see how it looks. As you can see, that name appeared above the message box, as opposed to being in the message box when we previewed it. How do we do this? Well, this was done using another one of the YEP plugins. This time, we used the Message Core plugin. The Message Core adds a whole lot more to messages, including the function to display the name above the box as opposed to in it. This is great for when you want to say who's actually speaking, and still have another space in the text for all your message to the player. Also, you'll notice that the message box didn't fill the whole screen. This is because we've changed the default width to be 816. Now 816 is the default width of RPG Maker itself. And you may be asking why I've done this and not kept it at the new resolution that I set, which was 1280 by 720. Well, as you can see, when we edit our script here, when a character talks, you get this line here. This line indicates where the edge of the box will be on the default RPG Maker window. If you are to change your screen resolution, this line means nothing. So, by putting it back to the default length on the message box, but keeping the window length the same, we can easily see how our message will look. So, what else do we do in our chat? We 
next show picture two. This time, we're using picture number two, but we're using image one one. This image here. But when you saw it in the video just a moment ago, you would have noticed that he was facing the other direction. So how did we do this? Well, once again, we've set our direct designation for the location of the Y at 270, but we've positioned him at 1200, so he's on the opposite side of the screen. We've then set our width scale to minus 100% to make him face the other direction. Next, we get our main character to speak, and once again, we use the same message to bring up his name. Slash n, triangle bracket, slash n square bracket 1, close square bracket, close triangle bracket. Finally, we're going to change our battle music to match what we want. In this case, we're going to play 0-3 Endless Battle, which sounds something like this. So it's a kind of dramatic battle, and we've got our battle processing here. Now, how have we set our battle processing to be different? We've told it to ma battle this specific enemy here. So this troop, which we'll go through later on in another episode. And we've told the game that we can lose this battle, because this battle we actually need to lose. Then, after the battle is over, if we win, nothing's going to happen because you do zero damage on every hit, so you can't win. But if we lose, we're going to fade out the background music for three seconds, and at the same time, fade out the screen. We're then going to erase images one and two that we created earlier on in the event. Finally, we're going to play a sound. And we're going to wait 60 frames. And I've noticed one here that isn't working already. So let's fix that. So what's going to happen here? We're going to play the bell sound and wait 60 frames. We're then going to repeat this a few times so that you get a constant bell sound like a church bell ringing on the hour. So at seven, it will then wait 180 frames. But why are we doing it this way? Well, if you don't put this weight here, they will all play at the same time and you will just get one bell. That is all you'll hear. So by telling it to wait 60 frames, it sounds like it's a church bell ringing off in the distance. So after 180 frames, we're going to play another text box. Once again, our main character is going to say something in chat. We're then going to transfer the player to a new location. and fade in the screen. And that is how it ends here, however the event itself is not over. Once we've done this, we'll go to where we've transferred the player, here. And we've got another auto run event off the map up in the top here. It is a good idea to put your auto run events somewhere where the player can't interact with them and force them into play. So what does our new event do? Well, we're once again going to show the picture. However, we're going to put it in a different location, this time at x100, y270, and this time we're not going to flip the image, so we're keeping the width at 100%. We're then going to have our character say some text to the, to the player, and then erase the image, recover the entire party, and set control switch A, control self switch A to on. Well, have we done this? Well, once this is done, we do not want the event to run again, so we create a new tab to run when self switch A is on, with absolutely nothing going on in it. We also make sure that this time we keep we keep it on auto run here, but when on the self switch page, we turn that off and leave it on action button. This way it does not interfere with the character and cause any issues. Finally, for this episode, I wanted to make it so the player could not save whenever they wanted, but rather at specific points. So, I did this by creating a save point. Here we have a green crystal that will represent the save point. When the player speaks to it, it would ask them would they like to save the game. Once again, we're using the same name tag from the Yanfly message core 
to display a name above the box, and that name will appear in green. Finally, we will have options for the player to select yes or no. Once we've said yes, we're going to open the save screen. And if they say no, we're just going to exit the event processor. And that is it, that is our intro area done. As you can see though, there are a whole lot of events around the screen as well. So let's quickly go over some of these. The first one, let's go over, is the chest. The chest plays a, mess plays a sound of the chest opening, does a movement route on the object, the direction fix off to turn left, wait three frames, turn right, and wait three frames. Then turn control self switch A on. It'll then give the player one potion and inform them that a potion was found. It'll then, on self switch A, have a direction fix chest that's open. But how did I create this? Well, rather than going through and creating that myself, under events, click where you wish the event to be, right click, under quick event creation, select treasure, and this will create your chest. You'll then get given options on what you wish the chest to look like and what items you're going to give the player. A few other things to note are these events scattered around the map. Let's take a look at the one by the cooker. This is a directional based event meaning it'll only affect when facing a certain direction. In this case, we want to check if the player is facing up and facing the cooker itself. If they are, we want to display a message. We're going to show our image before doing this and we're going to erase it at the very end. So if the player is not facing up, the image will just erase anyway. And that is it. If you have any questions on RPG Maker or any of the scripts, please leave a comment below and if you want any tips or tricks on specific scripts or how to run certain events, once again, leave suggestions in the comments below. Next time, we'll be going over how to configure your scripts and plugins and make sure that they are working. As you can see, I have a lot here, so it is obviously going to be something you will need to take care of. You don't want to put something in the wrong place as that will cause you issues. So until then, thanks for watching guys, I'll see you next time.